me it looked like a big hulk of steel. It looked so tall, it seemed to reach the sky. And it looked so long, there seemed to be no end to it. And I said, but Dad, how could that ship stay up in the water? Oh, he said, son, that ship will always stay up in the water. Well, you see how wrong he was. Belfast, Northern Ireland, an ancient city on the doorstep of Europe, where industry and commerce flourished for centuries. Today, it's better known as a city recovering from almost four decades of political violence. The world has been all too familiar with the tragic images that became synonymous with the name of Belfast. However, almost a hundred years earlier, Belfast was to be linked with a very different tragedy, the memory of which was to haunt the city for much of the 20th century. In this film, we will hear the voices of local people who witnessed the construction of the Victorian era's greatest maritime accomplishment, and the experts and enthusiasts who are determined to embrace the legacy of the RMS Titanic and give her back to the city that gave birth to her. Times it's hard enough without you spending what money we do have on beer. Pender Waste tonight. Have great news. The lads are telling me they're building two new ships in the yard the Olympic and the Titanic. And they're looking men to work on the Titanic. Do you think our Willie could get a job? It's no bother. The lads are saying there's loads of apprenticeships going. I'll put a word in. Sammy, that's great news. It was really busy. I mean, this was the, probably the biggest um, output of tonnage in the United Kingdom at that time. There were two shipyards here at the time, uh, Harland and Wolfe, and a smaller shipyard called Workman Clark. Harland and Wolfe were referred to as the big yard, while Workman Clark were referred to as the wee yard. But in those days, I mean, in 1912, for example, um, there were 12 ships launched that year in Harland and Wolfe. And really, as soon as one ship was launched, uh, the slipway was, was cleared and the keel was laid for the next ship that was going to be constructed. So this really was, in Belfast here, the centre of shipbuilding for the United Kingdom and for the world as well. Belfast was unlike any other Irish city. Uh, it was a major industrial centre, manufacturing, engineering and of course shipbuilding. Um, and shipbuilding was uh, the, um, really the most important industry in Belfast at that time. Uh, it had expanded quite rapidly uh, from the, uh, the mid-19th century and uh, by the time Olympic and Titanic were built, uh, Harlan and Wolfe employed uh, about, um, about 15,000 people and uh, the shipyard had become the largest in the world. The conditions for the workforce were really hard at that particular time. Uh, they were required to start for six in the morning, working through to about half past five in the evening. And in fact, if they didn't get in for six o'clock, the gates were shut uh, and they were locked out for an hour and not allowed in until seven o'clock, and then had their wages docked by an hour for the loss of that hour. But basically, there were three ways of gaining employment in the shipyard uh, in Titanic's time. One was as a premium apprentice, and that's where your, your family would pay the shipyard to train you up uh, as um, a gentleman apprentice. And you would really become uh, a, a master of no trade. You'd become a jack of all trades. Uh, and after that, you'd be given a position as a junior manager and work your way up through that. The other way was then to come in and do the standard apprenticeship, where you would come in and do five, six or seven years of an indentured towards an apprenticeship. And again, your parents would have to pay a fee to Harland and Wolfe for you to come into the shipyard. And the last way, and I always think a very cruel way of gaining employment, was the casual labour scheme. That was where in the morning you would find several hundred labourers standing outside the yard. The foreman would come out knowing that he needed maybe 50 or 60 men for the day and would pick those men that he needed. And if you didn't get work uh, at that particular time, there was no state benefits, so there was no money coming into the house, there was no food on the table, so it was quite a hard way to work at that particular time. My father was a, a joiner who worked in Harlem Wolf all his lifetime. 
with great pride, as many others had, in the building of this great ship. And I used to see pictures in the newspapers. When I was a wee fella, I used to draw wee pictures of the Titanic, with the four funnels and the smoke coming out. But I was all thrilled on one occasion. He said to me, Johnny, I'm going to take you down on Sunday afternoon to see the Titanic. I couldn't wait until Sunday arrived. And we went down in the tram car to the Queen's Road. There he took me through the, the gates of the great shipyard. And just on looking to the right, I saw this big, to me it looked like a big hulk of steel. It looked so tall, it seemed to reach the sky. And it looked so long, there seemed to be no end to it. I took great interest in everything that was happening around me, particularly the great ship, the Titanic. And this ship was being built by Ulster people who had no coal and no iron. But the Ulster people were extremely able. And the ship rose and they brought in the anchors and drays, which were drawn by 20 horses. And they, I couldn't imagine how this ship was going to get into the water. My dad started explaining to me, he says, you notice that it's lying at a slope and it's been propped up with all those, those logs. Now, in a few weeks' time, he said, men called stagers will come along and they'll take all those logs away and the ship will slide down into the water because there's grease below it. On May the 31st, 1911, Titanic rolled down its slipway to meet with the sea for the first time. My father took me to the launch and it, it was a lovely day, sunshine, brilliant sunshine, and the smell of the sea and of the shipyard and thousands of workers and people waiting for the great event and all the ships lying off waiting for the launch. And suddenly a flare flamed into the sky and the chocks were knocked away and the hydraulic rams gave it a gentle push and 30 seconds later it was in the water and made a huge splash and the sound of the withholding chains dragged along was terrific and then the cheers broke out. The Titanic's a very, a very evocative name. It's, it's been with me all my life, right, in childhood. I, I, my father actually worked on the Titanic. He came out of his time when the Titanic was launched and he became a full, from being an apprentice, he became a journeyman metal worker. My father told me again, I'm going to take you down to see the Titanic. And this time it looked more like a boat to me because it was in the final preparation stages that were going away. It had the four funnels, the captain's bridge, the masts, the lifeboats, and the gangways were all placed on it and the workers were going up and down carrying furniture on board and all sorts of electrical fittings. And uh, I thought it was wonderful just to see it all. There it was in all its grandeur. The shipbuilding at the height of its at the height of its powers in Belfast, and those beautiful staterooms, all those finishing trades, and all the marvellous staircase inside the ship and everything. Something that, that, that the city would have been and should have been proud of. They had to do in Ireland with the sea trials for the vessels, uh, and Titanic's was, was scheduled for the 1st of April, 1912. 
Uh, they arrived down early in the morning, very early in the morning, uh, and got, getting the ship ready to go for the sea trials when the weather was so bad that they waited and waited and waited, and finally late afternoon or early evening they made the decision that they couldn't do the sea trials because the weather was so bad and it was abandoned for the day. They then came back on the 2nd of April and decided to do a shortened sea trials. Normally, whenever Harland and Wolfe did their sea trials, they came out of Belfast Lock and headed north towards Glasgow. But for Titanic, they came out and sailed south towards the Isle of Man, taking a lot, a lot shorter route. They left early in the morning, returned back in around about 6 o'clock in the evening, where the ship was turned around. At around about 8 o'clock at night, Titanic uh, weighed anchor and started on her, her voyage over to Southampton, uh, going out of Belfast Lock. I watched the trials up and down Belfast Lock. It was a huge ship, and it was so big, it made the lock, it made it lock look quite tiny. It was a remarkable thing. But I was entranced by this, and eventually, I watched her go off on the second of April. What's keeping you? We're going to be late. You're going to miss him. What's the matter with you? You should be a proud dad. Our son's sailing on the Titanic. Not everybody gets a chance to get it. Sammy, I'm just worried about him. He's my wee son going that big ship. He's 17. And anyway, the sense the safest ship's ever been built. He'll be all right. I suppose you're right. He's a lucky boy going in that ship. I'll go and get my coat. That was some occasion. There were thousands and thousands of people. And we saw the Titanic coming up, being towed by, by the tow tugboats, as they were called. This is one of my favorite pictures of the Titanic being towed up the Belfast Lock. Uh, they were still uh, doing the cosmetic details in it. They were still uh, painting it and cleaning it. In fact, I spoke to one gentleman uh, some years ago whose father uh, painted the ship and travelled on Titanic over to Southampton, still painting away at the vessel. And really, I think the, the, the whole thing was, if you saw anything that looked wet, don't touch it in case the, uh, the paint hadn't dried yet. Even when they arrived in Southampton, uh, there was a change made on uh, the ship, on, on both sides of the ship, uh, and the in, in, internal decorations of it. Uh, and still, right up until the last moment, they were practically working on the ship. My friend Ralph Ryers, who passed away, and I was with him at the time, the last thing I collected from him, and he had rolled it up and he'd written my name on it. And it was a, a beautiful drawing he'd done for the Titanic Society. And it's a marvellous view of the ship going up the lock and you, you drew in the lock sides at each side where you can see see it going out and in, in the foreground what Raoul loved about it was he said this is before the tragedy he said it was a cause for great celebration so all his characters in the foreground are cheering and roaring and drinking bottles of stout and waving that's typical of Raoul he said this wasn't a tragedy this was a celebration the tragedy happened later it was something that the city was so proud of, the shipyard men were so proud of. When it got to about Bangor, all of a sudden you could have heard the swish of the propellers and the tugboats would release themselves and the Titanic steamed away to Southampton. And of course, we all waved it goodbye with her handkerchiefs and we sang Rule Britannia. Little did we think it was sadly indeed goodbye. On April the 15th, 1912, four days into her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York, the Titanic struck an iceberg. The wound to her hull would prove too great to survive. Titanic sings! Over a thousand lives lost! Belfast Bray hits an iceberg! Latest news of survivors! Oh no!
I can remember well the uh, the day the news came that the Titanic was sunk, and these wee paper boys were running up the streets with the newspapers under their arm and a wee poster in front of them with two significant words. I'm sure you could guess them. Titanic sunk. And my father came out to the door and he just broke down and cried like a child. There were 36 people on board Titanic from this part of Ireland uh, when she set sail, and sadly 28 of those were to die. In some ways it was very sad that it was nearly forgotten about in Belfast. I mean, at one stage, whenever the news came through in Belfast, grown men were seen standing crying in the streets. Um, but sadly, quite quickly, the news of Titanic was put to one side and forgotten about, and really wasn't talked about for many, many years to come. Titanic really was the world in miniature. Um, we had rich and poor, uh, workers, labourers, managers, officer class, all on board. And when the ship sank, it was as though the whole world had upended itself. In Belfast, there was profound uh, shock and, and grief at the loss of Titanic. Uh, not so much for the loss of the ship, but for the Belfast people uh, who had gone down with her. And in the shipyard, the, the sense of grief was for the loss of their former friends and colleagues uh, who would not return. Another Titanic could be built, indeed was built, it was her sister ship Britannic, um, but that the lives which had been so tragically lost could never be replaced. On that night, there were really so many heroes. Um but one that really stands out was Thomas Andrews, uh, the chief naval architect who was travelling on board the ship in charge of the Harland Wolf Guarantee Group. He was seen advising others to get warm clothing on and get as quickly as they could to the lifeboats. Uh, and he was actually seen at one stage near the end making no attempt to save himself whatsoever. Uh, he went down with the ship that he helped create. The one thing about Titanic was it happened over such a long period of time compared with other, other disasters. I mean, the ship hit the iceberg uh, on, on the, the evening, and it wasn't at sort of a 20, to, 20 to 12 in the evening, and it wasn't until 20 past two the next morning that the ship sank. These people knew what was ahead of them. When you think of things like the Herald of Free Enterprise, uh, if you think of the, like the Twin Towers, which happened within a couple of hours, uh, if you think of the Challenger disaster as well, which happened really in front of our eyes the, on the television set, they didn't have a chance to question what was happening or going on. But here, for about four hours nearly, uh, they would be able to question that the ship was sinking. There was nobody near them to help them. Uh, the nearest ship was 60 miles away that was coming to their assistance, and they were very much on their own with a limited number of lifeboats. It would have been a terrible position to have been in. Everybody called the Titanic the, the unsinkable ship and everybody, their pride was hurt, the father especially, when they heard that it had sunk. And not only because it was sunk with all the great grandeur on it, all the beautiful workmanship, but all the lives that were lost. It was very, very sad. And that's when it became the shadow over the city and the shadow over the over the shipyard. All the men felt a, a sense of uh, the fact that it was a ship that they built, went down with all that loss of life. wasn't their fault at all, of course. But they couldn't believe it. They just never got over it. And they, they, they and I, I think they felt a sort of that somehow there would be a collective blame that, that nobody would be able to ever, ever get to the bottom of. It was a ship that they built. Titanic was not the only ship in Harlan Wolf's yard at that time. The yard was on an expansionist uh, boom and uh, there were seven or eight other ships being built simultaneously with Titanic. They're actually known by their numbers. Olympic Titanic sister ship was 400 and Titanic was number 401. Well, that Olympic was, was actually brought back to Belfast and fitted with uh, sufficient lifeboats. Her double bottom was raised. In fact, they tried to make her actually unsinkable. When uh, the inquiries were over in 1912, especially the British inquiry, Harlands were quite content that 
uh, they had done nothing wrong, that the ship was uh, a, a perfectly good ship, and they were more or less exonerated by the inquiry. So, but uh, they were reluctant right up until the maybe the 1970s to open up this debate again, because there would be a lot of uninformed uh, opinion, uh, which is almost impossible to answer, because uh, these questions st keep, still keep coming, and no matter how, how logical Harlan's response would have been, uh, it would not have satisfied the people. I think that it has more been some kind of uh, shadow that has been connected to us for some time that we didn't like to talk about it. However, what that is important to know is, of course, that the rules to which the ship was built is still the rules that are covering the world today. Nothing has changed in connection with how the ship was built. The only thing that has changed that is the number of lifeboats. Uh, so there's now a seat for every passenger. Uh, that is, of course, a little bit strange to look back in time and see that was not the case at that time. But otherwise, the way the ship is designed today is exactly the same way as Titanic was built at that time. Really, I think it was just the shame of, of, of such a perhaps a large loss of life at that particular time um, that happened. But really, Belfast had nothing to be ashamed about. Here we had built not just Titanic. I mean, she was one of thousands of ships uh, built here in Belfast, uh, but bu built of the best best steel, the best rivets, by the best workmen in the yard, leaving Belfast the biggest and best ship in the world. Really, we had nothing to be ashamed about in Belfast. What happened was a disaster, really. Titanic, the ship wasn't. Since that fateful night in 1912, Titanic has become a fascination for many whose lives have been touched by her legacy. Not least, Belfast naval architect David Livingston who dived two miles below sea level to see the wreck up close. The first thing I saw, because uh, we arrived at the bow, and the bow was looming up out of the mud and out of the darkness, and you had to be pretty close before you could actually see it. It looked absolutely immense, because you were right down the seabed and it was looming over you. When you moved along the, the forecastle deck, saw the windlass, the anchor arrangement, the, the chains, which are still there, the little davits for the chains. And then you move down the hull, you could see the plating, you could see the rivets, see the number of rivets that were, the number of rows of rivets, uh, and how, how they were put together. It was really quite an impressive sight. We sat on the bridge for a little while, uh, we're putting down some experiments to try and uh, see what the, what the rusticles were doing because they're living organisms. It was really j just at the front of the bridge, just in front of where the wheel would be. The foundations of the bridge were still there, about the, which is about the only, only bit of wood th that you would see on the ship. And you had got to wonder that about what the last people who were walking on that bridge, what they were thinking about, uh, as they more or less knew that uh, the ship was doomed. And this beautiful ship on its maiden voyage was going no further. However, the whereabouts of Titanic's wreckage had remained a mystery since she met with the seabed in 1912, until in 1985, a former U.S. naval officer made a sensational discovery. When we found the Titanic, we were naturally excited, elated, because it had been a hard-fought battle to track her down. She'd, she'd put up quite a resistance to all the previous expeditions. So we were celebrating, but then someone in, in, in the control room looked at the clock and said she sinks in 20 minutes because it was 2 in the morning and she sank at 2.20. And that innocent comment was, we were embarrassed. 
that we were celebrating anything. And it was like someone took our mood and turned on a wall switch. And we went from being the professional that was excited about their accomplishment to the human who realized that we were at that spot. We had, we were where it all happened. And, and, and it spoke to us. It was like the ground speaking to us. And so we went into a very somber mode and someone had brought a Harlan and Wolf flag. And we went out on the stern of the ship and raised the flag. It was two in the morning and had a quiet moment. And the mood never changed from then on out. It was just serious documentation, very somber. Model maker Ronnie Hope devoted his free time to creating lifelike models of Titanic from the actual ship's plans. She was the ship, the number one ship in the world at that time. And then to, to have gone down on her maiden voyage before she'd even completed her first voyage, it was tragic, really tragic. And that, to my mind, when I'm building this thing, and it's never far away from my mind. It's a great pity, indeed. To the Harland and Wolf workers themselves, who took such pride in, in making it, and then to have the, the thing go down within a few days, must have been a terrific shock to them. And uh, I'm not, I can't un understand, I can't imagine really how they would feel about it. I mean, not having worked on the thing myself, but having worked on this model, I can, un I can feel for them, you know, they, they must have, must have been a terrible shock. I can imagine them, the people running down the, the the deck, the promenade and the boat deck, to try and get to the ship and see that <coughs> the water gradually coming up forward. It is an emotional occasion when you're working at it. Before Kate and Leo cavorted in the Titanic's prow, Belfast filmmaker, the late Bill McQuitty, made what many consider to be the definitive movie about the doomed liner. Walter Law's book took 20 years to write, and he interviewed the survivors, and he knitted everybody in the ship together um, so that he knew what any particular person was doing by knowing what they were talking to somebody else. They all cross-referenced through the thing. When I got the book and I went to John Davis for the money to make the film, he said, Bill, it's just another shipwreck. And besides, it's been done before. You know, there have been lots of shipwreck films. And I said, John, this is not just another shipwreck. It's the end of an era. And he said, none of your Irish brownie. What do you mean? And I said, well, in the memorial to the Titanic in the city hall and the war memorial, the war memorial it was 1914, and the Titanic Memorial was in 1912. And on the Titanic Memorial, the names of the dead are in order of importance. And on the War Memorial, they're in alphabetical order. And that was the change. It was an end of an era. No one ever thought the same again. It wrecked 
Victorian arrogance. My film had 200 speaking parts. It had just as much attention to the third-class passengers and the second-class passengers as the first-class passengers. And it involved them all in it because they felt everyone in the theatre had a connection through one or other of the people on the ship that were similar. I had Alexander Wojcicki, who was the best uh, um, set man in, in the world, and uh, I said, we need to build a third of the ship, a center third, which will have two funnels and four lifeboats and uh, will be the right size. And we had the blueprints. And so for him, it was straightforward. But everything was absolutely correct. And when Edith Russell came to see me, she was a terrific lady and full of energy and very much uh, involved with the Titanic. I said, Edith, I'd love to have you advising us. You can be at my side and tell me if you think we're going wrong. And I took her onto the ship eventually and she walked around the deck and she stood where she was when it went down. And she said to me, Bill, you've done a wonderful job. This is exactly, you've got the ship absolutely right, but you still need me because I know what happened in the lifeboats and at the time. They had to lower the lifeboats into the water. And I had this in the Shaw Savile line on their turn round in the docks of London. And they had agreed, and I had big lighters with huge lights on, and I'd, I had hundreds of extras already for the lowering sequence. And uh, this was to start on Friday, on the weekend. And I had to do Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then they wanted the ship back again. But suddenly the port captain rang me up and very upset and said that the chairman of the Saw Savile Line I refused to allow me to do this. They felt it was bad for business. And I, I uh, had to think very quickly. I went to the P&O, they refused point blank. And then I took a plane, I went up to the Clyde. And I found the shipbreakers, uh, W.H. Ward. And they were breaking up the Asturias, which was uh, Churchill's flagship. It was white. I got the Glasgow Art um, uh, College to paint the ship black. I had the proper davits and the, the proper lifeboats. I said to the chairman, I said, I only want to shoot this at night. You can go on breaking up your side that they were working on and you leave my side to me at night for 10 days. How much will we charge? And he said, a hundred pounds. He was delighted to do it. And I said, well, can you give me a contract for that? Because I think there may be uh, ructions. So he gave me that and sure enough, I got a telegraph <laughs> and the next more day saying, don't have anything to do with McQuitty. We spoke on the telephone and um, I sent me a lovely Christmas card, which uh, said that the ripple from my ship, my Titanic, had gone round the world and uh, this was one of the repercussions that had come up. He used my phone and 
it was to get the thing accurate, but he would never let that interfere with the love story. His film had about eight speaking parts, and it was about two young lovers. And in order to make the thing more dramatic, he sank the ship vertically instead of horizontally, because there's no excitement in water creeping up like a thermometer slowly, slowly. And of course, uh, when you're dealing with the love story, it's a different matter. And in the um, iceberg thing, the, the loving couple are not only in the bars, but they're standing on the rails. And they're going 23 knots through sub-zero thing, <laughs> and their hair, <laughs> their hair is blowing in the wind, and they've been frozen. And the lookouts, instead of watching for life, but are watching them canoodling, you see. And suddenly, when they look up, there's the ice belt, and the fellow says, ah, sh and rings the bell. But um, this is good for love stories. Not all Titanic love stories are fictional. It was the Titanic convention held in Belfast, and um, Ian was Lord Mayor at the time, and I met him through the convention, um, which ended in the City Hall with a, a banquet. and. Uh, a number of strange events led to me being left completely alone that evening, so um, I ended up dancing the rest of the evening away with Ian. So in a strange way, the Titanic brought us together. I saw this beautiful young woman who was like a vision, um, and to have her associated in any way with the Titanic was wonderful to me. I was brought up in the little village of Conlig, just outside Newton Ours and near Cumber. And uh, it was there that uh, Lord Purry spent his boyhood. And he was a great hero to me in my youth. He was the man who uh, really thought of the Titanic and built the Titanic. So that the Titanic was something to me that was very, very special. And when I saw this wonderful girl in this room, which was almost like the great rooms in the Titanic, it, it was just like a vision to me. My relatives had actually worked on the Titanic and had come up from Conlig to work there in some state in Belfast, so I had a link with the Titanic that way. But there were other sort of relationships with the Titanic over the years which I thought were very interesting. Um, Andrews, uh, who was the chap who designed the Titanic, was the nephew of Perry and his mother came from Conlig as well. So therefore, you ha it was seemed to me full of Conlig characters, the Titanic. My grandmother went up to see the Titanic on, on, the, on the maiden voyage, but uh, as, as many people did in those days. So that all in all, the Titanic to me, as it still was, was the most important thing to ever come out of Ireland. And certainly the, the, the most well-known thing uh, to be associated with Belfast and so I've loved the whole story of it over the years. We decided for our honeymoon that uh, we would take the Titanic route so to speak and uh, we travelled to Southampton um, to catch the QE2 and um, travelled to New York passed over the spot where the Titanic went down, didn't we? We did. We had it completely authenticated that we were over the side of the Titanic. And it was funny, it was announced over the ship's radio uh, internally that we were passing in all the different languages, German and Japanese and French, which was very interesting and people started to talk and chat around about the Titanic. So it, it really is a very well-known theme. 
Kerry was actually in a book of Harland and Wolf, you know, her whole lineage, since Kerry is, is actually collaterally descended from all the main characters here, she's the sum total that is left, really, of, uh, of, of Thomas Andrews, who, who, who designed the Titanic, and of the Perrys who built them, and of many of the other great commercial people of the day, so that, uh, you know, really, the, the past, uh, the present, and perhaps the future are all bound up nicely together and carry yourself, certainly for me. Today, Belfast is a very different city. A vibrant and busy cultural centre enjoying the economic benefits of a decade of peace. As our people work to put the political differences behind them, they are now also ready to embrace the legacy of Titanic. Here's her. Here's her flower. Where about did it hit the iceberg, Josh? It hit it in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Atlantic Ocean. Can you remember the name? The place where it hit. Um, Fanula. Newfoundland in the Atlantic Ocean. So did it get to New York? No. It didn't get to New York. 2012 will see the centenary of the great ship's completion and Belfast is now a city that wants to celebrate her. We're unique in some ways in Belfast that we can look and celebrate Titanic. The rest of the world commemorate Titanic, but we can certainly celebrate the ship. I think it's fine to be celebrating the, the building achievement of Titanic. It has become, a, in, a, in a way, a, a symbol of regeneration. But of course, for the world, it's the it's the great symbol of disaster. So there, there are different sides to Titanic, um, but I think in Belfast, I think what, what we all, almost what we must have is the, the perspective of commemoration of the loss of Titanic. Not just the loss of the, the great machine, but what we must commemorate is the loss and remember is the loss of, uh, of all those people on board who, who died in the most appalling circumstances imaginable. My great-grandfather was a cabinet maker and we have a titanic chessboard which he had made of, of cuts of titanic wood. So the f it's always been in my family lore, titanic was there, the chessboard was there. And then uh, in 1985 when Ballard discovered the wreck of the titanic, the rest of the world got terribly excited, but there was nothing happening here. So uh, myself and a few others thought, Right? Why should we not have a Titanic Society here? Because they're all over the world, but not here in the place where she was longer than anywhere else apart, apart from where she now lies. I mean, given that Titanic was only in the world scene from the 2nd of April 1912 and she left here until she sank in the 5th, 13 days, and yet is probably the most famous ship in the world apart from the Ark, perhaps. But how many people know she was built in Belfast? She's got Liverpool across the back of her and she left from Southampton. So what uh, I felt most strongly is that we have to place Belfast in her correct position in the Titanic story and forming a society was a step in the right direction. We have had the table about 10 years. It was in a store in Harlan and Wolfs. They offered it to us um, if we wanted to put it on show. And as we have the public and so on through here on occasions, we thought it'd be something very nice for them to come and look at. It was built actually for the Titanic in 1912. It was built by Harlan Wolfs' own tradesmen. Um, and as sometimes happens in this part of the world, it wasn't quite ready on time for the, uh, for the vessel sailing. Um, so the story has it that it was actually sent to Southampton to await the return of the ship. But we all know what happened on its maiden voyage. And apparently then the table 
was eventually sent back to Harlem Wolves and it remained in Harlem Wolves until it was uh, displayed here. I think historically the, the, there's always been a, a sort of a thwarted pride in, in Titanic, uh, the great lost uh, ship. Um, but attitudes have changed o o over the years. Uh, but today, uh, Belfast has uh, uh, appropriated Titanic much more as the uh, international brand, fusing um, profit and pleasure and memorialisation. Yes, we are standing here talking about Titanic because she sunk, but yet let's use her as a hook to attract visitors to this other proud maritime history that we have that we haven't told the world about before. Even to come into this room now, uh, you, you know, you get the impact of this room. It's a beautiful building. It is going to be restored to its former glory and it's the whole heart of the story. This is where the dreams that were in Ismay's head were put down on paper and just out that window is where those plans of paper became a ship of steel. The Dockland spaces where Titanic took shape, for years left for Wasteland, are now a hive of energetic construction as Belfast prepares to remember. The area even has a new name, the Titanic Quarter. Eric Kuhne is the architect commissioned to design the quarter's showpiece, Titanic Signature Project. Titanic Belfast celebrates over 250 years of astonishing shipbuilding history that only Belfast owns around the entire world. But the iconic nature of the building itself is inspired by water crystals, icebergs, the White Star of the White Star Lines, but most importantly for us, it's inspired by the great hulls of the ships that were actually built on this shipyard. Oh yeah, of course. Oh, perfect. All right, well then you've already got the detail. That's yeah. what... Excellent. All right, well, we're good to go then. Once we tapped into the magnificent architecture of the scaffolding and the aerial gantry and the building of the ships themselves, you don't have to look anywhere else for such majesty. And the idea of the ship's hulls representing the four eras of shipbuilding in Belfast, timber, iron, steel, and aluminium, all of it fell into place, and the clear crystal that nestles between each of those halls is inspired by the derricks and the scaffolding and the hoarding that was built to build these great ships, and out of that crystal, aligned with the center of the very shipyard and gangways where the Titanic and the Olympic were built together, you can stand and see where all of this happened when Belfast owned the center of invention and innovation and shipbuilding back in the early part of the 20th century century. The location of the Titanic Belfast building itself is at the end of the double slipways where the Titanic and the Olympic were built side by side. It actually sits on the ground to the old plating works from view out of the very drawing office where all the drawings were being created that actually allowed the ship to be built. So that intersection of the drawing office, the location of the plating works, and standing at the head of the bow of the ships on the old slipways is a perfect location to tell the story of the richness of all that this part of Belfast has had to offer. This is just absolutely spectacular. It's, a, it's perfect. Titanic is going to shout to the world about the genius of engineering innovation that Belfast owned. The strength of this building as the largest Titanic exhibition in the world will teach the world about all of the artisans, all of the shipbuilding magnets, all of the great leaders of, sh of shipping around the world that was concentrated in Belfast. This is going to restore Belfast as the centerpiece of one of the finest areas of shipbuilding all over the planet. It really is the biggest thing in the, in the whole Titanic world at the moment, so it, it can't but help place Belfast right at the forefront of the whole uh, interpretation of the ship. 
my personal feeling is that I would prefer this as a shipyard with a lot of sparks, a lot of hammering, a lot of industry going on, a lot of people working at shipbuilding. People will be able to come and see, smell, feel and touch shipbuilding where the ship was constructed herself and I think we should be very proud of ourselves in Belfast to bring this and have this here so people will come and see the true Titanic city. Finally, we have something that is saying to the world, we built Titanic, okay, it was a disaster and we must never forget that over 1,500 people died in it. But it was a tragic accident. You cannot blame anything. It was a coming together of circumstances. But it's about time Belfast picked up its place in the Titanic story and that this city bec becomes known as a Titanic city. As Belfast mends its broken heart and builds an optimistic future, so too do we mend the name of RMS Titanic, one of the greatest feats of engineering of the 20th century and, despite her tragic end, a ship that we can rightly be proud of, a ship whose brief life has taught us many lessons. Her legacy is finally coming home to the place where she was born. Shall be the love to Keep us together